Um, it is I. I am here to show you what an everyday Edwardian woman would have worn, so from around 1907 to 1910-ish. Um, so I am started, I already have my uh, chemise, my corset, and my drawers on, and my shoes and socks, and you'll notice this time they are, in fact, shoes and not boots. Um, in the early 1900s, women started to wear shoes. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't like an immediate switch, you know, 1902, boots stopped being worn, shoes start being worn. So there was a gradual change. So 1890s shoes start to come in and by the 1920s, they kind of taken over. Um, you'll see the corset has these little patches here. I've had this corset for quite a long time and the bones have started to kind of shove through. So I've had to put on these patches to um, keep some of them in place. Oh. Sorry. You'll also notice that this corset is um, similar to the one in my last video, but different. If you haven't seen my last video, I highly recommend you go and watch it. Um, but you'll notice that the one in my last video was more hourglassy um, than this one is. But you'll see this one puts me into the sort of S shape. It's pushing against my abdomen, my lower abdomen, and forcing my hips back and my bust forward. So it gives me this S shape that was very stylish in the early 1900s. Now, to exaggerate that a little bit more, I'm going to put on a bustle. Oops. And just tie it here a little bit lower so I can tuck it underneath the corset so it won't create a bump. There. So this will just give me a bit more of an exaggerated shape. Again, um, you will notice people who've seen my last video that some of these layers are very similar to how they were in the 1890s but there are some significant differences, such as the bustle pad. Now, bustle cages, I think sort of 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, were long since out of fashion, but these pads were still being worn. So, corset cover, again, just like from the last video, And I tie it as is tradition. <laughs> and now the petticoats. Petticoats are still being worn. They continue to be worn. Really kind of even, you can see them sort of today in the form of, of slips. You know, people, women will wear sometimes a slip underneath their skirt. Um, but there were very much worn really until the 1920s when um, the more slim line came in. Um, sort of, I think, the flapper type of look. But now we still want a very voluminous shape. So we need petticoats to really <coughs> Fill everything out. Hmm. Wish I could go a little bit faster for you. <laughs> and last but not least, so in the Edwardian era, skirts did start to shorten a little bit. Um, if you look at like fashion illustrations, you'll still see women generally with skirts kind of piled up on the floor, really long skirts. But if you look at like street photography, street photography, photography um, 
showing, you know, just women walking around, everyday women going about their everyday lives, you'll notice that the skirts have shortened a little bit, so they're a few inches off the ground. So, you see, I have a very unnatural looking shape, and that is due to the bustle pad, the shape of the corset, and a little bit of puffiness in my corset cover. Um, and in the Victorian and Edwardian eras, you didn't want any sort of lift and separate action it, with the bust, so you would, um, my computer screen keeps on going dark. So some women would wear pads here to really fill this area in. You'll also see on some vintage lingerie there are quite large bows here um, that would serve to kind of fill that area in. So. Next comes the bodice. This is an antique one. It's navy blue corduroy. Yes, and it looks like it is not showing up at all. So you'll have to take my words for it. Um, it is a navy blue corduroy, and it would have originally had a matching skirt probably, but the skirts don't tend to last as well as bodices and shirtwaists do. Skirts would drag on the ground, even if they were shorter, you know, going downstairs or bending down or whatever. Skirts were closer to the ground, they would catch on things. Um, so, skirts don't tend to last in as large numbers as upper garments do. And so this also most likely worn by a married woman who had a husband to help her do up the buttons because they are challenging. I am not married. So I have to do the best I can on my own. on here. <sighs> Sorry. So you'll notice that the sleeves are kind of short and there's a little bit of a plunging neckline, ever so slightly. Now this is something that you would not have seen in the previous century. Um, Victorian era had long sleeves. There was a bit of a trend in the 1880s to have three-quarter length sleeves, but they never really would have gotten up here. So Victorian dresses generally have long sleeves and high necklines. Now if you were talking about a ball gown, you could have um, like a just straps that would go across like this. But for a day dress, you would have generally long sleeves and a high collar. So this trend of starting to show just a little bit more skin started in the Edwardian era, and it kind of picked up steam throughout the 1910s and then really took off in the 1920s. And I am, again, so sorry. This is taking so long. Almost there. There we go. So, you see the excess of fabric, very poofy here. Um, that is, again, showing the S shape. Um, this is called the pigeon-fronted look, for obvious reasons. If you have ever seen a pigeon, they have this very swollen chest. And their heads move when they walk, which I think is absolutely hilarious. I love watching pigeons walk. They crack me up. Um, but you can see I do look kind of pigeon-like with this um, 
profusion of fabric here, and it does, it, it, the, the point was to make my waist look smaller. And you can see it does. Um, if you have kind of loose, baggy fabric here and um, petticoats kind of poofing out your hips, your waist is going to look smaller. So that was sort of the point of this pigeon-fronted look. And it also, you know, made you look more buxom. So the skirt hasn't changed a whole lot since the 1890s. It's become a little bit less structured, and as I said, it was a little bit shorter. But for the most part, it hasn't changed a whole lot. So, yet more tricky buttons. Sometimes I really am sorry that they didn't have zippers back then. Oh, for Christ's sake. Now it looks in this video <laughs> as though I'm wearing black entirely, but I am not. The skirt is black, but I promise you the the bodice is blue. Oh, come on. I will try my hand at my uh, very poor editing skills and see if I can edit around some of this button shenanigans. Ha! Got it. So, now I will just make sure everything's sitting right. And the skirt does have this opening here, so I have some snaps to fasten just to make sure it stays closed. There we go. <sighs> so I'm just going to uh, make sure that the bodice is correctly situated. sash. You'll recognize this from my last video, as will you recognize this, the shoe button hook. And again, I'm going to use the button hook to do up the sash. And turn the sash to the front. Can't really <laughs> see over this large bodice. <laughs> and once again, I'm going to pin the sash here so it won't ride up and show the button on the waistband of my skirt. Earrings, again, earrings were popular in the Victorian era, they were popular in the Edwardian era, they're popular now. They've been worn only for almost all of human history. Um, and, okay, necklaces. The Edwardians loved their pearls and their beads. And this is a fondness that carried over for I'm just trying to find the uh, tie. Um, this is a fondness that carried on until the 20s. If you think of flappers, images of flappers with their long 
necklaces and they'd be like twirling them around like that. Um, but the Edwardians would probably like double, double team them like that. Um, the Chatelaine, you'll remember this from my last video. This is still, still fashionable. This is a time when a dollar could get you everything you needed for your shopping excursion. So you could put your dollar and your handkerchief in there. And your hat. Now, straw boater hats were fashionable in the 1890s for men. But in the early 1900s, women started wearing them as well. And they remained wildly popular for the first decade of the 20th century for both men and women. Now, there was also a trend in the early 1900s for absolutely gigantic hats. And those would have been worn more by the wealthy women. Um, and I have heard that some of these huge, wealthy women's hats could weigh up to 50 pounds. Now, I'm not sure if that's true. I don't know how you could fit 50 pounds of stuff on a hat, but according to rumor, that is the reason that the parasol came to such prominence in the early 1900s, is that you didn't need it for, to keep the sun off your face because you had a huge hat to do that, but because the hats were so heavy that they would throw you off balance and you need the, needed the parasol to balance. Now again, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's true. That's probably just a rumor, but it is a very fun rumor. Um, but here you see, so I'm gonna back up. I am an Edwardian lady, first decade of the 19th or of the 20th century, and I am ready for my day.